Hi, Suzanne here, and welcome to another Path of Excel University. And uh, this is going to be PUE 101 and a half. So we do have some past ones, which are very up to date, seeing as there hasn't been any crazy changes for new players. So if you're completely new to the game, there should still be quite a lot of things you'll learn from this, but there will be some things that you might not understand. And we do have like past ones that you can watch. So check those out. We have a lot of good things. So, because so many new players are trying Path of Exile, we're going to try to give information about tips and tricks without spoiling the game too much. And I'm also going to try to cover the topics in slightly more in-depth than normal tips and tricks video. So there's going to be a lot of UI things and stuff like that as well. It'll also include some basic mechanics and skill gems, weapons, and how damage is calculated. Obviously, PoE is a very complicated game. Yes, it needs stuff like this. So first off, there's some really good UI stuff that you can do. There's even some veteran people that don't know this. Like a lot of people run around with a minimap looking like this. You can still see my cursor, right? Yeah. Um, and you can see that it's like kind of, you don't need this, right? It's just fucking random debris. So if you put the landscape transparency all the way on the left and the map transparency, I like to have it all the way on the right, but anywhere like here onwards, then you'll get like this nice sharp outline that you can see more and then play around with the map zoom until you're happy with it. Some people like zoomed out, I like zoomed in. Um, there are different cursors you can do without like needing third party like yellow mouse and stuff like that. Um, so they put that in game. There's even some you can buy now for even more. Um, and then uh, yeah, it, it's uh, in UI options and default mouse cursor and cursor size. And then another one that's really important in UI options is show uh, mini or sorry uh, mini life bars on allies. It's like a little green bar, and that'll appear in the middle of your screen, so you don't have to look in the bottom left. So very very big, and obviously appearing over enemies. Skill gems can be placed on any piece of your gear, but if there are support gem modifiers on the item itself, then the skill needs to be socketed into that item. Like here, it says socketed gems are supported by level 16 faster projectiles and level 20 tends to poison. So, for example, if you have heavy strike or something like that, that doesn't need to be in your weapon normally, right? The only exception is if something says socketed gems are affected by. So don't worry about whether your attack is in your boot or your weapon or your glove. Um, and skill gems can change item level and attribute requirements as well, which we'll cover later. You can stop leveling a skill gem by right clicking the level up icon. There is no automatic level up for PC that only exists for console. Console is like the ugly stepchild of PoE. They get super neglected, but they do get to, uh, level up their gems automatically. They have that. They have something. Um, and the skill bar, one of the nicest things you can do, and I literally, this is the first thing I tell a new player almost, is swap your left click to move only. Because if you don't have that, you'll like accidentally hover over a monster and start attacking with your wand auto attack. Sometimes you get stuck. It's really bad. You never want your mouse button wand to be anything but move only until a lot later when you understand why it can be different things. Um... And then if you see, if you click, for example, in this case, the fireball spell, a thing will pop up where you can click always attack without moving. You should do this on every single thing except dash. Dash, it'll make you go backwards. So sometimes people will have that in tips and tricks videos to put always attack without moving. We'll see new players putting it on dash and then just like, great, really fun. Um, if you go to do your skill bar key bindings, you can keybind, rebind everything here except left mouse button. Left mouse button, I think you would need like a um, third party tool to do, but there's not generally a need for that. Um, the number one thing that I really like to do is instead of using Q, I put spacebar as bound skill four, and then um, I use that for my movement abilities normally. And we do have a second bar that you can hold by accessing control. I rebind all of these. Like, for example, I have mouse button like here. I think I have this one for just Q. And I use that for like auras and stuff. And bound skill 10, I have that as mouse button 5. And you don't need to hold control to access your second bar if you make them, you know, not control. You can just have them as like T or mouse button 5, etc. So a lot of veterans even don't know that. Sometimes they'll have flame dash on my second bar. And people are like, how are you using flame dash? It's not on your bar. 
I'm going to call this on my second bar. So very, very good to know that you can do that. In the user interface, the number one tip, and this is good for items, crafting, everything, holding Alt down is basically show me more, give me more information. So that's very, very important. It'll say that for the like skill tree stuff as well, and it'll generally tell you what it is. There are some things it won't give you that much information by, like for example, nearby and things like that. It won't give you an actual range number, sadly. Holding control is also going to do a lot of things like allocate passive skills without confirming or moving things from your inventory to stash or to the vendor window. And then we have control shift is an additional modifier for more. It only works in certain situations. Um, like, for example, you can buy a full stack of fuses from the vendor. Um, it's very, very nice when you're like, if you're going to buy like 500 fuses. Yeah, you don't want to just like spam click one, one, one. Um, and holding shift and clicking is if you have like 20 fuses or 20 transmutes on your cursor and you're holding shift and start clicking, you're dumping one and one and one. This is really good to do with fossils, for example. There are chat commands as well, like help will give you a list of commands, but the ones that are really, really good is slash passives. That will, once you've killed Katava, will actually list all the side quests that give skill points. And say you're missing like the crab quest, it'll say the quest and zero. Um, until you kill Katava, it'll only display the ones you've done. If you're wondering how many it is, um, it's 22 skill points if you're killing. No, it's 22 skill points if you're helping the bandits and 24 if you're killing them. Is what you're going to have once you've uh, finished killing Katava. And then, yeah, clear ignore list. This is sadly useful because the ignore list is very limited. So if you're ignoring a lot of scammers and stuff, it'll fill up really fast. Um, slash passives, like we said. And then there's Atlas passives as well. Same as the other one there. Very good. And then slash invite and slash friend can be useful. So instances and zone reset. So areas have instances and they generally stay up for 8 to 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, don't forget your loot on the ground and things will close. They won't stay up forever. And if you're holding control while entering, whether that's through the actual like, waypoint device or whether just going to a new area, most zones will allow you to make a new zone. So if you're like really underpowered, maybe going back and farming like a really nice zone can be really good for um, doing that. Brian, I'm going to load up Path of Excel for this because the three to one recipe is so strong and it's a little bit hard to explain. We'll, we'll log in. We'll log in. See what I have enough of. Here, we'll go here. So three to one recipe is so good and you'll see every veteran player uses this at start of league. Um, I'm gonna put these somewhere. Oh, and another nice command. Um, so some of you might know about affinities and that they'll go automatically to the folder no matter what. But you can bypass this by holding control shift. That bypasses affinities. Right. So let's grab all of these scriptoriums. That's probably going to be the easiest. And as long as you have four maps, you can do this. But, you know, the more you have, the more likely it will be. So if we look now, Scriptorium is tier one here at the bottom. And this with no watchstones in is what's really important here. Because what I'm about to show you does not get affected by watchstones. So what your Atlas looks like now, and this is going to be different in the new patch. They're removing and adding some maps. But what your Atlas looks like with no void stones in is called your natural Atlas. So for example, these are the natural tier 16s. So if you're ever horizon orbing a tier 16, those four are the only ones they can turn into. Yeah, void stones, not watch stones, sorry. But right now we have Scriptorium as tier one. If I search for tier two, you can see that there's a bunch of maps. And again, these specifically are changing. But you see here that we have precinct, belfry, etc. And just by these scriptoriums, what I can it? get every single one of them. So these these, they sell for Grotto. And no matter what I do, like no matter how I put these in, they sell for Grotto. But when I remove this one and put this one in, that's stagnation. So those, Grotto. 
Excavation. Belfry. Silo. You see, and then you can just like play around with this and put. And think of this as like you're playing around with a chemistry set and everything has their own unique item ID, right? It's not like currency where they fall into a stack. Um, so like, again, these three always grotto, but you can just play around. It's like a new recipe each time. So just by playing around with it, like they'll always give a random one of the tier above. Um, and obviously there's no like set. You just have to play around with it. It's like digging it with the car key. So it's really, really useful. You should, you, you'll figure it out. It's like, hopefully most people understand just by seeing this. Um, so very, very good. Very, very good for this. And that's what we do every single league start. And um, I can show what I meant with Horizons as well. Like Arid, oh, Arachnid Tomb. I don't think Arachnid Tomb. Yeah, Arachnid Tomb is where? Here. It's currently a tier 8. I have it as a tier 16 because of the Void Stones, right? But even if I have all the Void Stones in, now every map is tier 16. The only ones at the top are the four that you can horizon to. If you're ever wondering what you can horizon to, you can just check what does your natural atlas provide. The map device, or sorry, the map tab is really, really good for this before you fill it up too, because it'll initially only show all your natural maps. So very, very good to know. And I hope that helps a lot of you. Um, and yeah. So the more you have, the better. I think if you have seven, you statistically can get every map of the tier above. So obviously with four, you have very limited. You only have like 12 options or something, nine. Um, another thing that's really good is selling a level 20 gem with one gem coded prism is going to give you a level one gem, but quality 20. So for example, a good use case for this is I'm going to be playing explosive iron league start, right? So I have one explosive iron in my bow that I'm using, I'm killing things with, but I'm also leveling six explosive arrows in my off hands. And then once they hit level 20, like I might have a shit ton of gem cutter prisms. They're putting Sanctum back in, right? So I might have a shit ton of gem cutter prisms, but I'm not going to have 140 for all my seven explosive arrows, right? So I might put 20 GCPs in my first explosive arrow and hope that I hit a 21, 20 on my first try. But if I don't, what I do is I'll sell six level 20 explosive arrows uh, with six GCPs and they'll make them level one, but quality 20, saving me 120 uh, gem cutter prisms and it's so fast to level gems now because they've added a reward from rare monsters that it'll just randomly give you like basically a level it's like crazy xp so well before it would maybe be like level 95 until you hit like level 20 gems now it's like 91 or something crazy um so it's very fast so make sure you're always leveling gems in your weapon swap uh, once you've leveled everything that you need yourself, you can start leveling things to sell. And there's been some leagues where there's just been a huge demand for some things. And you can make, like, a lot of money. Another thing that's really good is there are some good vendor recipes for iron rings. And this is really, really good. Like, how many people have found an elder or shaper iron ring and be like, okay, well, I don't need an iron ring, so they'll vendor it. But you can turn that into a sapphire, topaz, or ruby ring by selling with a blue, a green, or a red gem. So this is really good for whether it's influenced or at the start of a league when you really need one for, um, for getting a resist early. And then these recipes are very, very good as well. Weapon and Rustic Sash. Um, so uh, the Rustic Sash needs to be either magic or rare. And then you use a whetstone, and that'll be um, physical damage. And then rune dagger with a chain belt, magic rare, will give spell damage. There's honestly, there's so many recipes. It's actually pretty useful to just Google like POE wiki recipes and look at them. And one of the biggest, honestly, I think this is the biggest tip that like so many people don't know. You can craft on white items. So I do this. Every single league start, like if I find a ruby ring, I'm not going to throw a random essence on it. I'm going to craft lightning resist or cold or fire resist on it. Um, and I do this on almost every gear piece. And what this allows me to do is I focus so much more on gear, on, on socket pressure than actual resists. Because you can resist crap by just having 
Like maybe you pick up one resist node on the tree and then you craft a rest and you will find and identify maybe one or two good rare pieces or maybe you'll find a good ring or a good amulet with some resist and uh, another open suffix to craft. But so many times people will actually alchemy or essence their shit early on and it'll be full with nothing. So now you have like a sub part, it's literally worse than a white item. Because you'll get so many transmutes. So just chucking some resist on everything, super great. And um, yeah, normal items have no affixes, but they can have one prefix or one suffix. So resistances work in PoE? Yes, it's a bit of an overwhelming thing for D4 players. But yeah, it's huge. So that's that's how, like a lot of people are struggling with resist cap as a new player, but that's how we resist cap so easily as a experienced players. And flasks and jewels are some of the most underrated things for new players because they're probably thinking how important can they be and very often you'll see new players have no utility flask or maybe a quicksilver um so my first ever death in path of exile was actually because i didn't know you could roll flasks and i didn't know you could have instant flasks and instant flasks or half instance flasks also called bubbling is um, one of the biggest saviors of your life on hardcore because you're very rarely in Path of Exile like, oh no, I'm dying. In like six seconds from now, I'll be dead. Overtime life last. Oh, I'm still dying. It's very like, you're dead. Um, so you're most likely going to get bursted down and I have like panic situations and then instant life lasts are huge. So remember to upgrade your life last while leveling. And Divine is generally the best. Eternal is better for over time. But yeah, Divine is generally what you'll see most people do. And yeah, remember to have two affixes on them. Phasing is basically cheating. The difference, you could just play around before the league starts to like really get a feel for it. But try standing in a pack of monsters and then just try running around in the pack of monsters with a Quartz Flask. So as long as you have Quartz on and you're running face first into the monsters, they're basically not going to do anything. Like, PoE has a really hard time with, like, actually hitting you. So that's why you'll see a lot of people have, like, a Quartz, a Jade, a Granite, and a Quicksilver, and one Life Flask. I mean, sometimes you do need to use a Mana Flask. Um, but a big focus for a lot of people is getting rid of your Mana Flasks very, very early. And, like, Granite, Jade, Quartz, huge for defense. Resistances are super important. It's not like D4. So, yeah, make sure you use your Crafting Bench a lot. And you really want to understand, hopefully your build guide will tell you this, but how does your build scale? Like attack skills will scale usually with weapon damage. So it's all about your weapon upgrading, right? Whereas spells and, and some attacks like explosive arrow, elemental hit, etc. will scale based on gem level and added damage to spells from your weapon. And then it doesn't really matter that much about upgrading your weapon. And you could actually just like over level a lot to gain a lot of power. Whereas if you're an attack based build, you're getting a lot less power from gem levels. So knowing that distinction is very, very important. Another thing that's very important is increased and more and increased taken. So increased a good way to think of that when it says like 26 increased spell damage this is additive right it's additive with itself so if i'm getting um 26 spell damage here 26 here 26 here you're just adding those up whereas if you're getting 20 more spell damage 20 more spell damage and 20 more spell damage they're all multiplicative with each other um so it's 20 times 20 times 20 instead of 24 plus 24 plus 24 and Increased will be multiplicative with more. So say you would get a total of 400 increased spell damage. That's multiplicative with 40 more spell damage, which is also multiplicative with 40 more spell damage. If you don't understand the explanation, think of it just additive and multiplicative, right? Then you understand that it's better. There is also some sources like Skitterbots will shock things. And there is some wording like increased damage taken by. And that's multiplicative as well, but they're additive with themselves. Um, so, for example, getting 20 increased damage taken by is great. And if you're getting more of this, let's say you have two different sources, right? I have 20 increased damage taken and another 15. It's basically 35, right? So it's not as strong as more, but it is a different group than increased. So it's sort of like a, a halfway point. Um, so it's just important to understand that increased taking is stronger. 
Now these these are a little bit complicated and we have some like math examples here too right if you have 100 base you have 20 increase and zero percent more but 20 percent increase damage taken then yeah you have this one group here where it's all the increases added together then you have a separate more multiplier we can see how much stronger it is here with just obviously it sounds like smaller numbers you have 100 percent base 130 increased 70 percent more 20% increase damage taken. You see here it's grouped into the different brackets that it's getting multiplicative. Um, and then it's 496. So it's not that complicated. I'm probably explaining it badly and maybe it sounds worse. But yeah, more is better. So build guides, obviously very, very important for new players. Sometimes people will say, just play around and try stuff on your own. Those people are stupid. Don't do that. Don't try things on your own. And the reason I say that, obviously it's a fun experience for some people. I've had so many people that have had their game ruined by that. And that's because Path of Excel doesn't have good respec options. So don't try your own thing. You should follow build guides for your first build. Um, unless you're very willing to literally start over from scratch. Um, it's one of the things I wish the game would change the most to make it more approachable. Like... The end game respec options are very fine. Like as a, as an experienced player, I have no problem respecing. But uh, a new player, you're completely shafted. You are fucked. You will not be able to respec as a new player. You'll maybe you'll get to like level 50, 60, even 70, you're fine. And then you get into maps and you start playing and you're like, "Man, I've really fucked this up. How do I change this?" And like so many times I've had people come like this, uh, can you fix my build? And I'm like, man, this is really fucked. It's like, no, you just got to start over. Literally, like it's not worth it for you to do anything but start over. Um, so I think most people, and obviously there's always exception, but most people end up having a better time by following a build guide. And there's a lot of good places to find build guides. I would recommend myself as the absolute best source of new player build guides. Not very humble there. Um, but I think most people will watch for that. And then there are a lot of good creators. I would say most streamers make pretty good um, guides. There are some that will focus more on like other advanced players. <laughs> Stay humble, sis. I mean, <laughs> it's not wrong. Um, our, ours is very like step-by-step -step and all my content follows or focuses on new players. And I do collabs with a lot of creators that do lots of good stuff as well. Um, there are good websites as well. The problem is a lot of the websites also have um, bad guides on them. Like, for example, the PUE forums also have, like, really good guides. But a big problem with the PUE forums is that there are some good build creators that will make, like, really nice layouts, make everything look really professional. It'll be really good. <laughs> the people making bad guides will copy that. So you have no idea as a new player whether they're good or bad. Um, so, yeah. I, we do post league starters every league start. And, um, yeah. They're, they're very solid. We've only ever had one guide that was bad. And we've learned a lot from that. So it'll never happen again. Or explosive arrow. Um, there are literally guides. I don't even want to mention them. People will probably mention them in the comments and in chat, but there are literally YouTube channels that exist to make bad builds on purpose. And when you then ask their support team, like, Hey, how can I make this build better? They're like, well, you could buy, um, currency for real money and buy these expensive items, uh, that you need to fix your build. So Yeah. You do have to be careful, but most large creators that are actual streamers would be called out and eaten alive or like called out by other creators. So. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's hard as a new player. Generally, go by recommendations. And that's why I always say like the best way to support the channel is, you know, if you've ever recommended my content to someone that's new, that's like some of the best support. Uh, we can take questions as well. And obviously, do remember, we do have other PU University episodes both coming up and that are the last... Anything within nine months should be pretty relevant because there hasn't been any huge sweeping changes. Um, do we have any questions from maybe new players about, like, basic stuff? Is the Path of Excel build channel legit? No, that one's a literal dog shit. Like, that is a, the single worst one.
Hell, when trouble work with your projectiles? I don't think it does. Uh, why do you choose a token? It's like a PeeWee meme. People would spam it in global chat. Can you explain local and global damage? Yes, I can. So, here. Um, so, for example, if this had spell damage... Actually, it does have spell damage. as an implicit. Like, this is global. And the attack stats here, like the physical damage, those are local. Um... Generally, local things will change the color of an item. Nearly everything on rings and amulets are global. Um, but like, for example, let's say you're playing at Thurl Knives, right? Does physical damage. You might think, hey, 68% physical damage. I'm balling. It's local. It doesn't actually apply to your spell, sadly. So a lot of things on a weapon, if it doesn't say that it's global, if it doesn't say two spells, then it's local. It is a bit hard to tell. But yeah, local is mainly weapon-based. There will be some things, like for example, rings can have fire damage to attacks. Right? That's like kind of local. Local adjacent. Are you going to go over currencies that are in core? I wasn't going to, no. But we do have some uh, videos that explain that. Um, I do have... Uh, on Wednesday, I'm doing everything explained. It's... Probably the video I recommend to new players the most. It's basically like Bob Ross and Path of Exile. And I basically play as if I'm a new player. I do like a full fresh playthrough as if I've not played before. And I explain every single thing. So it takes anywhere like five to eight hours. I do have some Sanctum videos on my YouTube. Um, can you explain crit chance? Yeah, sure. So there's two different types of crit. So gems... Like spells, like say Fireball has a 5 or 6% crit chance. And that's baked into the gem itself. But you see that the Sage one has an 8% crit chance. So that 8% crit chance is used when you're attacking with like Kinetic Blast. Uh, or like with the weapon itself. Like if, you, if you're a warrior or uh, well, you'll use Sunder, that'll also use the, the critical strike chance of the weapon. Whereas if you're using Fireball, they'll use the critical strike chance of the gem. Now... Sometimes you might see a shield, for example, right? With 100% increased spell crit chance, right? Does that mean you're always critting now? No. It'll basically add your base crit. So if I have Fireball, then it'll take my crit from 6% to 12% if that's my only source of crit. If I have 200%, it'll put it to 18% instead of 12 um, And this is why base crit is so important. Because if I get my base crit up to 15%, Getting a 100% increased crit chance puts it to 30. So, very nice. Base crit's very important. Ah, let's see. I followed your toxic rain ballistic at Increasable. Thank you for that. I guess I'm intermediate, but I'm wondering, is there something for further along uh, end game a resource? I noticed my survivability went through the roof. Just picking up taste of hate, and maybe I could have had it in the first month instead of the last two weeks at least. Right. Uh, we have another PU University that talks like heavy about mitigation and explains why things like that work and how important like layer defenses are. Can I ask something in Norwegian? No, I prefer that everybody does English. Uh, can you show when you have a lot of loot on the ground how you sort them better so you don't have to run around and pick them up? You hit Z twice. We also really want to have a strict filter. Tomorrow we're doing a how to customize your own filter with NeverSync collab. Think Holy Relic, Flicker Strikes, Fly, Wival Starter. I have no idea, honestly. Sorry. Already did more, which is increased yet. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between ailment, damage ailments, ignite, burning, etc.? Um, yeah, so for example, let's say you're making an ignite build, right? Uh, and you're using a spell. Let's say you're using Fireball. And spell damage sounds like it would be really good, right? But since we're scaling ignites, spell damage doesn't actually scale that, and you actually need to do elemental damage. And elemental damage, fire damage, etc., they'll actually scale your ignite. So stuff like that can be really good to know. Um, and there will be some things that will be considered ailments, some things that won't. Um, and then you have like elemental ailments, which is like freeze, rock, um, ignite, etc. And then you have. Um, Things like poison, bleed, our ailments. I think we do go over that in another PU unit too. We have so many of these now. <laughs> Can you explain leak starters? Sure. I mean, it depends a little bit what you want. And uh, there's a big difference between hardcore and softcore. A lot of people will go very glass cannon-y. 
on softcore and it'll be very different whether you're a new player or not but normally what i like to recommend i like to make sure that the build does not need a single item that you can't get in ssf um because what ends up happening, especially if, especially if it's rare, but even if it's like medium tier rarity, we saw this a few times with even items that were pretty common, like Cloak of Flame. I think Cloak of Flame is pretty rare now, but in the leagues where it were pretty rare, like if there's a specific unique that people need, everybody will try to buy it and the, um, the build will be really expensive. So we make builds that are, they look worse than most people's builds. I'd say all the builds I make, look worse than other people's builds because we put in so trash gear. This is like literally like 13 hours into the league for me. Um, and you'll see like literally just rares with life and resist because if I can make a build be okay and look okay with basically no gear, then it's probably going to be okay for a new player. And I would always rather that people like want to use my starters time and time again because they have a good experience then, oh, this looks really good on paper, but when they actually end up playing it, it's dog shit, right? There's nothing worse you can do as a build creator than give somebody a bad experience. And we only did that once with um, Explosive Arrow because we had miscalculated a lot of things. <coughs> and this wasn't just like us. It was <clears throat> six different creators. It was like me, Mathel, Rise. It was all size fault. We were using size base calculations. But what we did from that and what we learned... Um, which made this not a problem in the future was if we're doing something new and experimental first, we say that, right. I usually don't make build guides for new builds. Like for example, when crack clowns came out, we were like, well, we don't know if this is going to be good yet. It's a new skill. So this is what I would do for crack clowns. But if it's bad, here's what you can transition into. And we didn't have that for explosive arrow. That's what made it such a bad experience for people. Um, but yeah, so we, we like make sure that you have like, things to transition to easily i got baited by those 30 million dps guides when i was new yeah i think can you mention the correct wiki yeah you want to use the poe wiki the fandom wiki is really bad and has not been updated in three or four years there's even an extension that automatically redirects you to the poe wiki when you do everything explained can you go to get a first white map yes i will try i was just it's so long and I usually don't like eating during them. Is there a possibility for build guys aimed at more players or more experienced players? Um, that's usually what I do like a week or two into the league. I wasn't baited because I started with his builds. Yeah, we've we've only done one mistake in like seven years of making guides. So and the number one thing as a build guide creator, like try to be very honest. Who is for, where does it fall off? What's it strong? What's it good at? Right? So. <clears throat> but yeah, we'll end it there. And I hope you guys enjoyed um, the first episode this time of PU University. Tell a friend and there'll be more tomorrow. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Sub if you like the video. If you do like the content we put out, we have the new membership feature. Uh, for no advantage to you, but it supports me and my editors. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Try to die less than I do.